I just say uh, good evening, young lovers, wherever you may be. Uh, it is Valentine's Night, and welcome to uh, Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Steve Barbs, and I'm the chair of the committee. And if you would uh, give us the benefits of making sure your mobiles are all off or on silent, that would be helpful. Can I please advise you that we will be webcasting this evening, and, we, uh, and the record will be retained on the council website. Our cameras are set upon the microphones. So if everyone, when you speak, has a microphone on, we'll ensure that the webcast follows them. Uh, if an applicant or lead petitioners or agents do not wish to be filmed, uh, they can make, let, let us know before they uh, begin to speak, and we'll respect that uh, if they want. Okay, so please remember to use the microphone. Um, I'll explain my role is to make sure the committee runs smoothly, uh, regards of procedure, behaviour and, and ethics, and many people will know that the regulated committee probably is the planning committee, so we have to uh, follow very strict rules. Uh, to explain who the rest of the people are, uh, on my right, as the council solicitor, will give advice on the committee on procedural legal matters that may arise, and the minute takers and webcasters uh, over there. To my left are the council's, uh, council's planning officers, Highway Engineer, Environmental Health Officer, who will present applications this evening and provide technical advice as they are required. The rest of the people down both sides of the table are the elected members who will consider applications this evening and make decisions. This will be done as normal by a show of hands to vote. Before each application is discussed, there will be a short presentation from planning officers. In the event there is a qualifying petition, of 25 signatures or more, one representative will be invited to address the committee in support of the petition for up to five minutes. I will let them know when they have one minute left. However, if the petitioner has not addressed the committee, sorry, if the petitioner addresses the committee, then I will have to, well, I do have to ask the applicant to make their representation. However, if the petitioner has not addressed the committee, then the applicant or an agent will not be invited to represent, uh, make representation. A ward councillor can address the committee on behalf of their residents, but once they return to the public arena, they may not participate in any debate which follows. The application will then be opened up to debate, and a discussion by members of the planning committee will take place, and a decision made on the application. The order of tonight's agenda may change so we can accommodate members of the public and let them go home at a reasonable time. Uh, if a site visit is requested, and I have not been involved with any pre-site visits tonight, uh, is requested by the committee, then this matter will not be discussed this evening, will be discussed by the future planning committee. Uh, members of the public, uh, if that application may wish to leave. So there are the sort of rules and regulations of, of what is about to take place. So I'm going to go into the formal part of the meeting and just let you know the order of the agenda uh, that we made. Sorry. Okay, first thing for committee to agree, uh, the accuracy of the minute, sorry, before I start, I must say, um, David Elton, who, who obviously is the Conservative spokesperson, um, isn't here tonight. I believe he's quite poorly or he's had hospital treatment. I'm sure we all send our best wishes uh, to David for a, a rapid recovery. And of course, Council Ron Abbey uh, has a substitute in Julie McManus tonight. Uh, and we all know uh, Ron suffered the, the tragedy of losing his, his partner recently. So we send our condolences surely to, to him and his family. Uh, so can we agree the accuracy of the minutes on the 19th of January? Are they agreed? Can we agree? Okay. I'll sign those. We then move on to uh, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? <coughs> okay. Just to put that change in uh, Yeah. Uh, just to remind people, if they turn, um, and I did spot this myself, so I'll take credit for it. Um, item 9 still has Council Pat Hackett. Uh, that was the Capital Portfolio for Economy. Was it? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. good old days, Pat. And um, it's actually, as I understand, it would be Councillor George Davis. Uh, George, do you need to be played interest or is the advice yes or no? I'm sorry, not Okay, you'll have to make that decision, okay? 
So that is the, um, the, only, the only issue I'm going to submit. Uh, uh, not having requests for site visits, are there any? No? Okay, so there are no site visits, so the full agenda will be discussed tonight. And it will be done in this order. Okay, there's a number of people here for Warwick Drive, uh, a number of people for Gibson House, and three reservation order item number nine. So I'm going to suggest four, five, and nine. The first three, is that okay? No wrong? Okay, so take it into item four and our presentation. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair. This application has been referred to the planning committee by Councillor Jones and Councillor Hackett due to the impact of the proposed development on the amenities of surrounding residents. Um, following reconsultation on amended drawings, objections have been received and a bottom of the final petition has been received on the grounds of the proposal bill. Great part of the problems is out of scale with the character of the properties in the area, where a high risk of issues, density is too high, there will be a loss of trees. Um, loss of privacy and building will cover 80% of the garden area. This application is a direction of the part two, part three story extension to the rear of the existing property to provide four additional flats. The property is currently in four flats. As I in a designated primary residential area within Ronald's mutual development plan, the subject assessment under policies HS13, self contained flats, SPD2, flat development. The original stock scheme has now been amended to locate the extension 5.6 metres from the side boundary of number 23. This together with the fact that it's part of the site is at a slightly slight lower level than the next door property should be sure the proposal will not result in an unacceptable loss of light for those occupiers. In addition, the windows on that elevation are facing fronting the garden of number 23 are obscurely glazed, to sure there should be no um, overlooking. The proposed extension will extend the length of the garden area up to the rear boundary. Concerns have been ex expressed that the development would damage the tree roots located in the garden at the rear of the property in the Ignis Drive. The applicant has submitted amended plans that indicate measures that have been taken to, that could be uh, taken to protect the uh, roots of these trees, and this includes maintaining existing garden levels and ground, uh, and ground beams um, to protect the roots. Council's tree office has confirmed that these um, methods are all acceptable. The rear elevation of the proposed extension is blank and will be located some 27 metres from the rear elevation of those properties in the APS This will be released to the requirement of those distances um, within our, our, our policies. There are no objections to the proposal on high risk grounds. For these reasons, it's considered that the proposed extension is of scale and design is acceptable to the character of the area and should have no significant impact on the meters of the neighboring properties. For these reasons, the proposal is considered to be uh, a second of approval subject to the conditions attached to this report and the labels and the further amended drawing, um, which is where. Okay, yeah, which is submitted on the 30th, which was submitted yesterday, 30th of February. Thank you. Right, um, there is a qualifying petition. Is there a petition who wishes to address the committee? Okay, if you could come to the table there and um, put your mic on, and for reference, could you give us your name and address? And you'll have up to five minutes to address the committee, and I'll try and give you the information then for the day the end. Okay? It's been. Well, I'm also going to do it. You should go there when you're live. I could go around with its own call. No, no, no. No, it's not. Press the button. 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 Press the <laughs> okay, so then address and then five. Okay, right, my name is uh, Mr. Fanner, and I am speaking on behalf of the si 64 signatories opposing this application, for which there was no consultation with local residents by developers. Only four households were notified. 25 Wallet Drive was built as a house, and although it is now a conversion, it sits in the urban landscape as a house. The Willow Plan has strict requirements for extensions to conversions. The size of the extension should be appropriate to the size of the plot and not so extensive as to be unnailable. <coughs> the building takes up over two thirds of the garden and touches the boundary wall of a neighbouring property. It is not two metres away as planners claim. 
It is a block of flats shoehorned into an urban garden, and it is disingenuous to describe it as anything else. This proposed development is totally out of place in the area, paying no regard to the Victorian character of the drives. It is disproportionate to the size of the site, leaving only a narrow hemmed in strip as a leisure space for eight dwellings. We agreed with the planner's initial assessment that the building was too high and was too close and, quote, detrimental to the character of 23 and the wider area. The height has been reduced by one meter and the distance to the boundary increased by 80 centimeters. In the opinion of the planners, it will now, quote, not now have an overbearing impact on 23. These minor adjustments cannot possibly reduce the visual impact of this building on 23 or from the houses further up Warwick Drive and from Cape Ness Drive. This block will be dominating, if not domineering, in the extreme. It is to have a flat roof which, quote, characterises the area. Webster Avenue on the Manor's estate is sited, which is over 100 metres away in a totally different context. The only other flat roof dwelling in the road is a is single store. According to HS 11 section 5, flat roofs are only to be permitted on single story extensions. This alone should disqualify this building. The fenestration will be flat windows on a flat wall, which will be adorned with railings called Juliet balconies. A 15th century feature, which are, quote, modern in character and will complement this flat roof extension. There are no features that relate this to the character or style of its host building. Residents are horrified at the impact of the extra parking in a road that is already at capacity. There will be four parking spaces, but there are eight dwellings in total on this site, and multiple car ownership per dwelling is now common. Visitors will have to park somewhere, and that can only be in Manor Lane, which will impede service and emergency vehicles. We looked at possible nearby precedents. There were two in Caithness Drive, backing onto Lincoln Drive, which were more modest than this proposal. The first was for a two-storey dwelling to the rear, and another for the conversion of a garage to create a lot. Both were turned down on the grounds that they were prejudicial to the character of the area, have a cramped and overdeveloped appearance, incongruous and unsympathetic to the street scene, and will detract from the amenity. This is exactly the case with 25. As regards a recent granting of an application of the St. Nicholas's Vicarage site in Wallasey Village, the view was both buildings have generous rear gardens and are set back from the building line, ensuring they do not appear cramped. The design is traditional, using detailing and material, materials which would complement the existing building and will not appear incongruous in this setting. None of these criteria have been applied here. There are also strict safeguards in this development with respect to trees. Having discussed the similar situation at 25 with the planning department, we note that should the application be approved, the development would be carried out in accordance with Revision J. This together with the construction exclusion zone around the root protection area of the tree in 20 Caithness Drive would safeguard the health and stability of the trees in the adjoining properties. In the original submission, the existence of the trees was even denied. We therefore wish that the Planning Committee consider this opportunistic alien and unnamely garden-grabbing ambitions of an absentee landlord against the distinct character of an area and the quality of life of long-term residents. Thank you. Thank you. Well, okay, um, a petitioner has spoken, so I now give the right to the applicant or their agent to address the committee. If the applicant or agent present wishes to take up that right, Oh, what's that? Okay. I can now call Ward Councillor, if the Ward Councillor wishes to speak. Councillor Pat Hackett. Yeah, uh, you have a...
councillors have a little bit of time about these rules. Thank you, Chair. I won't be too long. I'm just try and cover some of the points that uh, that weren't addressed. Um, and under this issue, it's going to be a bit of a mess. Um, I'm going to start with the first one. Um, the first one is parking. Uh, as we saw when we came to visit the site on Tuesday uh, with the minibus, it could not if you be behind it. It turned around in the narrow laneway and as a result had to go straight onto the promenade to turn around and get back up onto a section of the promenade by the way the state's no vehicle access. It was said in the meeting that the angles in terms of vehicle access had been calculated but obviously not for the minibus or any reasonable size vehicle. For instance, the width of the lane, which is, and it's been measured, is 5.5 metres. And the minimum recommendation, I believe, is 6. So vehicle access will be extremely tight, uh, contrary to policy HS4. I think the type, well, the type parking, like the supermarkets, if you like, where you're between two cars and it's impossible to swing out in one movement and you have to do some towing and throwing. And of course there is no pavement. Uh, this sort of uh, is well used for anyone who's been along there uh, by kids, cyclists, joggers, etc. on the way to the prom. It was never made for cars and vehicles of all sizes. And particularly in the summer months, it will be congested with all these, with all these vehicles. And it's a recipe for our new accidents that happen. When they ask Street scene wants to put litter bins in, in this road, in Mallow Lane. I was told it's too narrow to put them there. So it's too narrow for, for litter bins. I'm sure it's too narrow for vehicles of this size. On another point of a main chair, it also sets, does it not, precedent for other property developers to gobble up the gardens in this area and beyond. But it's particularly unusual when we have heard from Mr. Fennett about a previous planning application uh, that was turned down in the adjacent roads in Caithness Drive, uh, which, which, uh, which has changed over the years. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the Caithness Drive one, they set the time that the general character of the area and the street scene, uh, due to the inadequate plot size, yeah, that's one of the reasons it was turned down, that would, would result in developers having cramped and overlooked, overdeveloped, I should say, appearance to HS4. Surely the same reason applies to this application and the sufficient reason to refuse it. It will change also the character of the air, as I said. It's the only building proposed to be built along here in a garden, and surely that's all contrary to HS4. I hope members, when considering the application, will refuse this tonight and take on all the policies of HS4. Because when you went there and you looked around, surely, surely um, the policy paper for in terms of vehicle access as I've explained and those who saw it, cars can not of a large appearance turn around in that in that um, in that cramped uh, environment. And also as well the actual uh, size of the building that's proposed to go there. It is cramped um, and inadequate due to the plot size. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Okay, before I sort of open up to members, a few salient points that maybe the officers want to reply for. Yeah. Are we in contradiction with HS4? Uh, issues around distances and being as to what is perceived as a boundary uh, and distances between properties. Um, and the other issue about traffic and turn events. So we'll take the planning officer first and then the highways officer, then we'll open up to members. Is that a fair way of dealing with it? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, the application extension does come before it's begun to uh, the end of the boundary wall for this site, and I understand we had a discussion going on our site visit. Um, there was originally, and it doesn't look like it's still there, a small alleyway, and the um, boundary of the green garden at Ignes is a little way away, but the application does come the full length of the garden and does finish at the end of um, the boundary wall here. In relation to previous extensions that were refused, I can't comment on those because I don't know anything about them, but each application has to be assessed on its own merits and in line with um, current planning policy guidance, uh, which the officer considers this, this has been. Okay, uh, I was upset, 
region. Uh, the parking proposed complies with the council's maximum standard of one space per flat. Uh, the parking area for the development will be accessed via uh, Manor Lane, and it has been demonstrated that adequate turning and manoeuvring can be achieved. Um, given the relatively low volumes of travel likely to be generated from for additional flats, officers do not consider the use of Manor Lane to access the proposed <coughs> space to feel safe. Um, our road safety records, which are provided to the council by the police, show that over the last five years there have been no injury related collisions along Warwick Drive or Manor Lane. Uh, the Society Fire and Rescue Service and Council of Waste and Recycling Teams have reviewed uh, plan developments and have no objections based on access to the road that is sufficient to accommodate their vehicles. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up to members. Questions, vote, comments? I'll take Kathy and Sam and Brian. Okay, take that one first. Thank you, Chair. I went on the site visit and, like all of these developments, I was quite appalled yet again at the small area of garden yeah. that's supposed to have four flats in it. I couldn't quite square the number of flats and the fact that it was a two story, three story extension on the basis that um, you could argue with three flats, three drawers. I don't know how many get four, and a number of our council hasn't adopted a minimum square footage for all the flats. And I sometimes think going back to this um, uh, elephant in the room of one of like H, I know it was well, but basically allowing anything to be flats passed that allows people to live in what I would consider to be inferior dwelling. This, is, I mean, this, this property would then have a dwelling unit in it. It used to be a house. The, um, the boundary goes right back to the wall. There's about, I don't know, it's 15 feet between the one, the one side of the boundary and the start of the other. But there's actually no community space whatsoever. And that's no community space for eight dwelling units. Now, I don't know from the plans that we know how many bedrooms there are. But they must be at the absolute maximum studio apartments, and I can't see how you get four in such a small space. I also think, looking at the at the area, that it's totally out of keeping to have something that looks, in my view, quite monstrous: a front wall, a flat roof, which I think are awful in most cases. But it seems that we've accommodated a flat roof um, to the, the height level, so they don't just it over there in terms of height. So we've, in some ways, lost a little bit of what might have looked a little bit better um, to accommodate something that flat would or look absolutely awful. I think, in my view, I think it's an early development of the area. Okay, I'm going to take the, the first three speakers and then maybe ask officers or some, I hope you can take the notes of what's being said. Um, I've got Sam. Uh, the, the, the developers, I can't, I can't argue 
we as a local authority notified all the all the uh, residents that we were, we were obliged to do, which would be all those that surround the application site. Okay. Okay, okay, George. Sorry, Chair, there's a good question about whether the plan that this site is
the vision for data storage on the plans as I have concerned that concerns about their inadequacy basically. Yeah, you know, that's why they to um,
related subject, dear officers may well not come to a different conclusion. Um, I suspect my conclusion is that it failed on each other's Okay, um, sensing from the committee that uh, there's issues around this application, I just want to set it in the context of where we are in terms of housing, in terms of demand for housing. Um, most people will be aware about the debate of the housing figures and targets that we have to meet. Uh, and clearly there's a move by individuals to want self-contained flats, that is where the, the market is. Um, so we are having heavier pressure put on the inner urban areas for more units to go in those as a way of protecting green belts and, uh, and current open spaces. However, we are the arbiters of what um, decisions go through and what isn't. And I am been made aware that the applicant has made several amendments to the plan to indicate uh, issues raised from members to the residents. Uh, I too went on a site visit, as you would expect, this chair. Uh, I had an issue, I asked a number of questions about whether there was reasonable immunity space for the occupants uh, after the development was in place. Um, I was given assurances that this would um, be adequate if tested that appeal. So I'm asking, as uh, any members here got reasons for refusal and have they consulted the officers prior to the meeting for reasons for refusal, uh, which I uh, would ask you. If the answer is no, um, then that's a lesson for the future. If you come to this committee with a mind for refusal, then please have some rehearsed reasons for refusal. My overall view is that this is marginal, um, and therefore, I think, as Chair, I've got the right to take this sort of silence and feel where this one's going. So I have asked for reasons for refusal for this development. Okay? And it'll be me who has to go to the inquiry, because that's the job for our people. So I'm just making it quite clear to the public and everyone else out there, and members of this committee, if you're mindful to refuse things and talk about refusal, you will need, at some point, to have a reason for refusal to move and be prepared to defend it out of here as we found in the past, because we are going against the officer's recommendation. However, I've looked at it and I think it's probably borderline, so I think we may have a chance for it to be tested at appeal. And I'm moving that the proposed development, by reason of its size, scale, and design, is considered to have a detrimental impact on the character of the area and is hereby contrary to UDP policies HS4 and HS13 of Grill UDP. And and advice contained within the National Planning Policy. So I'll move that, we've got a seconder for that. George, a seconder for that. All those in favour of the reason for refusals moved by me, please show. And those against? None against, so that's a unanimous refusal. We have been on the site visit, and that just shows the value of the site visit for the members, and I would ask more members to attend site visits in the future, they possibly could. Um, so, there you go. So, I hope people are happy with that result. Um, it may well be appealed by the, the applicant, um, and we'll, we'll know all about that. Okay? Thank you. So, those who attend that, they can leave, or you can stay and spend money on the Valentine's Day. Okay, then. Um, Okay, so moving on to item five, which is uh, Andrew Gibson House. If members of the audience can set them, I'll ask to be up. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this application is for the conversion of Andrew Gibson House to the State Board of Apartments, together with the conversion of the existing lodging to dwelling, construction of three detached dwellings and three new apartment blocks containing 98 apartments in a total number of 136 units on the site. Gibson House has a prominent position on Seamount Road and was originally constructed for the widows of the entire Sabre on the at sea. The building is currently derelict, but still has a wealth of character and interest in its conversion and renovation will have a hugely positive impact on the character of the area. To enable the renovation of Gibson House, the applicant proposes to build a large number of units around the building. This includes the development of the defined urban green space, which means the proposal is a departure from the UDP. 
The Wigger Hunt and Space Assessment Update found there's no shortage in the remaining green space for the long six settlement area as a whole. The area of green space that will be monitored is severed from the public realm by a one brick wall, there are no obvious defined entrance or exit points. A single foot platform is across the site, this is overgrown, and there are no benches or other features within the site. Great, the site also makes it generally unsuitable for recreational activities. Non balance is considered to be of poor quality and learns the community value. <coughs> the applicants have submitted financial evidence to demonstrate that the renovation of Gibson House can only take place due to this enabling development. This has been independently verified on behalf of the council, and the development here in the green space is therefore considered to be justified. The alterations to the Gibson House itself will be minimal in keeping with the building. The new houses to the front being reduced so that they have limited impact on the setting of Gibson House when viewed from Seabank Road. The new apartment buildings will be located to the north and east. It is accepted that they will partly sever the relationship between the building and the promenade. However, the new buildings will include design from similar large scale developments which will take place in the adjacent Marion's Park. The building will possibly address the promenade and Margaret Road, but given that the development will secure the retention and renovation of Gibson House. The scale and design of the proposed part of the building is considered acceptable. The proposed book by the 97 parking space within the site, and the condition being attached to enable the council to request a, a traffic regulation order to the Matic Road to provide general lines of dedicated residence parking should it be required once the development begins to be occupied. In terms of residential community, all possible windows of both the new development and the Gibson House itself will comply with the required separation distances and will have adequate armor. <laughs> One of the apartment buildings in Fort B has incorporated lower river windows to the south elevation in order to direct views out to the river, ensuring it does not result in overwalking of a neighbouring property. It is considered that the proposal will not have an unacceptable and adverse impact on the amenities of the existing neighbouring properties. Overall, the proposed development secures the retention of a key building, which is considered to be a non designated heritage asset, together with a significant number of new residential units to help the council to meet its housing targets. A number of conditions have been attached. Key amongst them being a phasing plan to ensure the renovation of Gibson House is carried out prior to any of the new open market housing being constructed. The application therefore recommended approval to get to these conditions. Thank you. Okay, there's no qualified petition on this uh, application, um, so therefore I don't have to ask an object to speak, and the developer would not have the right to speak, but I do. Uh, at the right well, I can ask the ward councillor to speak. Is there a ward councillor present to speak on behalf? Good evening. Um, you all know that Andrew Gibson House has been derelict for about 10 years, and over the past 10 years, there's been a number of um, campaigns to try and restore the building. What we have in front of us is um, a marvellous opportunity to restore the building. To quite opposite to the, the planning application beforehand. This is quality housing. It's a quality, um, it's a quality area, it's a fabulous area. It will complement the mariner's home. It will build, be built to a fabulous standard. And uh, in this card, the one thing that's missing in this card is if you live in a big house in this card, there's nowhere to downsize. Um, and so this type of housing is desperately, desperately, desperately it's going to um, <coughs> complement and it's going to enrich the, the area and if anything, it's going to help the area to grow and it's going to help us to, to change the heat box and change the feeling around King Street and, and the rest of it. So I think it's got potential to affect the whole area. The flats are absolutely beautiful. We're looking at really top quality co um, accommodation here in a most beautiful place. I'm sure they're going to be sought after. Um, and I'm, I'm asking you, you know, please um, support this application because it's it's a real chance to renovate and um, jobs and have to bring it back into.